All right, guys, bang, bang. Plan is here. She also happens to be my wife, but she is the founder of The Profile. Every single Wednesday, she writes a profile dossier, which is basically a deep dive on a successful person. She goes and scours the internet. She finds all sorts of articles, interviews, videos, podcasts, whatever she can, learns as much as she can about that person, and then writes it all down to save you, me, and all of the other readers time. I really enjoy reading them. So she's here on the podcast. And we're going to talk about some of the people that she's written recent ones on. What's up? What's up? How are you? Great. Great. I haven't seen you in uh, five minutes. I know. <laughs> All right. Let's start with Frank <laughs> Abagnale. Is that how you say it? Abagnale? Frank Abagnale. Yes, that is how you say this it. This is the guy who uh, Catch Me If You Can. Yes. Right? It was The movie was created because of him? Yes. It what? was Leonardo DiCaprio was based, his character was based on the real Frank Abagnale. Okay. I've seen a Google talk by Frank Abagnale. Mm -hmm. It's very good. Highly, highly suggest it. Um, but he's got kind of a crazy story. He was basically a criminal and then ended up helping the government. He was a con man of all con men. He was an impersonator. So before- He was the king of the con men. Con men. Yes. Okay. But it was funny because you want to say like, oh yeah, he was like a con man, whatever. He was a 16 year old kid. He was just really, really smart. And he, um, all before he was 21 years old, he impersonated an airline pilot, a doctor, a Bureau of Prisons agent, a sociology professor, and an attorney. And he did it so believably that people were like, oh yeah, that's a doctor. <laughs> and so what was the purpose for doing this? Was he like stealing money from people or was he just literally doing it to see if he could? So basically, uh, this all happened after his parents had a devastating divorce and he ran away from home. When you run away from home at age 16, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> when you um, when you run away from home at age 16, you need to figure out how to make money. He figured out quickly that he, stop it. <laughs> I'm fixing your microphone, go ahead. Um, he, he didn't kind of aim to become one of the most famous imposters ever, uh, but he ended up like he was forging checks. He was doing little things and I think his frame of mind was more so, I'm clever, they're not gonna catch me, I'm beating them at their own game, than it was, you know, uh, I'm, I wanna be a criminal. But he basically said like, the deeper he got into it, the harder it was to get out. Um, but he says like, in our society, people judge people uh, by, you know, you judge a book by its cover, you're judged based on what you wear and how you appear, so he just learned the game. Oh, if I put on a suit and tie, I can enter this fancy party. I can meet some people. I can just observe them. He would literally go to the lobby and observe attorneys and see how they acted and then impersonate them. So when you think about studying a criminal, that's not exactly the person I would think that you would go and, and learn something from. What do you think you learned from him? I learned a lot. <laughs> okay. And um, if you've seen the movie Catch Me If You Can, you know that eventually um, he gets caught by the FBI. He gets caught in France spends some time in a French prison, comes back to the United States and starts working with the FBI on uh, check forging and trying to like uh, catch cyber criminals as So basically well. he becomes a rat. No, he does not become a rat. He didn't rat on anybody. He's helping the FBI find criminals who are really good at what they do. So he switched teams. Then. He switched teams. Okay. But in his mind, he was like, I'm basically trying to repent for what I did. And this is my way of paying it off. He was with the FBI for decades. And I'm assuming he caught a lot of people. He did, I'm sure. I don't know the extent of it. Yeah. Um, did he go to jail? He went to jail in France, but I think he was... Uh, in the US, they're like, you don't have to go to jail, but you have to switch teams. Yes. Wow. I, I don't know how I feel about that. Why? Like, if you were a criminal, even if you're helping the government now, do you just not go to jail at all? Again, like, he didn't kill people. It's not like he was, like, a murderer who suddenly is like, oh, I'm going to help the US government. The US he government didn't deal saw drugs. he was... No, he, I mean, he forged checks and like got people, you know, took their money and stole. It's not good what he did. Oh, he did, did steal. Yeah. Oh, okay. I think. <laughs> I don't know. Um, but basically the whole idea is like, okay, well, you're really smart, obviously. He, um, like the ways that he would um, run away from the cops and the FBI for years is actually incredible. Like, like what? Hold on. Uh... Oh, no. What is an example of how Frank Abagnale would oh, run away God. from the police? 
So, um, he, I forget, there was, oh, okay, okay, okay. He managed to escape from police custody twice, once from a taxiing airliner and once from a U.S. federal penitentiary. But how did he do it? Well, long story, you gotta go read it. Oh, okay. All right, let's move on to the next person, Dolly Parton. <laughs> Wait, I but thought- you didn't, we didn't get to the lesson I learned from oh, you. okay, well, what was the lesson? Well, a lot. So, okay, so basically, Frank... Um, explains that anybody can be really, really good at um, becoming like, he basically says observation is a superpower. When he looks at someone on the street who's wearing a suit and tie, he can tell like that guy's a businessman who works at Goldman Sachs and the guy who's dressed exactly like him, I know that he's a drug dealer. And the way he knows is by the little tiny cues that the people give off. Most of us don't pay enough attention to the shoes, to the way they um, carry themselves to to know. So actually, you're much... Why are you laughing at me? The only drug dealers that wear suits and ties are pharmaceutical representatives. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead. Anyway, but um, he he's able to say like, you're very likely to get scammed and conned because you don't pay enough attention. So if you start paying attention, you might not be the victim of a con. Okay. Anything else you learned from him? I mean, a lot. But like, that is probably the best one. Yeah. All right. Dolly Parton time. Dolly Parton time. So Dolly Parton is just a country singer, I thought. Not and then, ch- and then oh. you basically broke down her whole life. She's been married forever. Yep. Nobody knows anything about her husband, really. Nope. And she's actually like a savage businesswoman who plays kind of dumb when she's in public. She's it's all, playing it's all chess a when everybody else is playing checkers. How she's do you so know? good. She's so she good. She couldn't beat me in chess, but go ahead. She's so good. So first of all, what you need to know about Dolly Parton is she was born in extreme poverty. She was okay. one of 12 kids born in a one bedroom log cabin in the mountains of Tennessee. And... um. And, and she grew up without electricity. Think about 12 kids in a one-bedroom log cabin in Tennessee. Sounds like they had a lot of fun. <laughs> and when she moved to Nashville, she, by the way, she met her husband the first day she moved to Nashville at a laundromat. And um, basically, she was trying to be this country singer, country star. And they were like, you're very rough around the edges because she came from like a really, really poor uh, place. And I watched this documentary and they were saying like, she would use language that was very crude that like ladies didn't use, um, but they liked her because it gave her character. She kind of played dumb, but she, she was wasn't honest. Dumb. Yeah, and um, and they told her Dolly. She was like, "Oh, by the way, I'm gonna get married." And they're like, "No, you're not. You have this like sex appeal. You're gonna play into this image. Basically, your career is gonna be over if you get married." And like men can't like you know fantasize like you're single. You have sex appeal, whatever. And she was like, okay. And then she didn't tell anybody. They got secretly married at the courthouse. And a year later, she went back and they were like, oh, no, you can't get married. Like, whatever. And she's like, by the way, I've been married for a year and you didn't know. And I have a great career. So what's your point? She she does things like that. She, um, uh, you know, a lot of people are like, they want to use stereotypes and make fun of her. Um, so they're like, oh, well, like if they want to make fun of the fact that she has a lot of plastic surgery or she has like really big fake boobs or whatever. And she and when they make a joke about it, they'll be like, uh, oh, well, you're fake or whatever. And she'll say, I may be fake, but I'm real in all the like places that matter. And she'll kind of, she's already expecting it. And she she um, like it tosses it back to them. And the whole point is like, you can only feel shame if you allow them to shame you. She doesn't care. Is it fair to say that most famous, successful people do not get lucky and they're actually very, very intelligent and know exactly what they're doing? Yes. Like she's yes. Kanye West is probably much more intelligent than people give him credit for. I think some people get lucky, but then it catches up to them and they fall into obscurity because they're not willing to be strategic. How much money do we think Dolly Parton makes? Do we know? Ooh, I'm I'm not I'm not sure. But like like do we think that she's worth a hundred mil, ten million, a billion? Mm. Probably like closer to a hundred million. Yeah. If I had to guess. She um she's actually really philanthropic. Uh she because her dad didn't know how to read, 
Um, she started an organization called the Imagination Library in 1995. Today, her program spans five countries, five countries and gifts over one million free books each month to kids around the world. And to date, she's donated more than 140 million books. Wow. 140 million books? Yeah. That's wild. To kids all around the world. All right. What'd you learn from her? Um, I learned a lot. <laughs> By the so, way, if you want to read the dossiers, you can go to readtheprofile.com. Readtheprofile.com. So, okay. So here's a fun one you probably didn't know. I learned Try that- Try me. Okay. So she, you know, at the time was kind of building her career. She was still relatively young. And imagine you're Dolly Parton. And you have this song that you wrote that you sang called I Will Always Love You. And uh, in the 70s, Elvis Presley wanted to record her song. But his manager wanted half the publishing rights. And she said, no, I, that's not fair. I wrote it. I sang it. It's my song. And she wouldn't budge on the position. So they couldn't come to terms. And she said, no. And people were like, wow, like, my God, she's a woman. She should be honored that Elvis Presley wants to record her song. And here's what she said. She said, I never thought of it as being about being a man or a woman. I thought of, about it as being an artist and a writer and a person of strong will. So she just like wasn't willing to budge on this one thing. And she said, it broke my heart to say no, but I was willing to suffer that temporary disappointment and heartache than to live with something that I knew was wrong. Um, so yeah, so then Whitney Houston, as we know, I Will Always Love You, uh, became famous. That that became her song. She became famous with that song. Uh, and Dolly says, um, I'm, I'm happy that, you know, she became that, that uh, people associate that song with her as long as, as, um, as long as I'm still making the money. So as long as Dolly Parton's getting paid, she don't get who gets exactly. the credit. Yeah. I mean, she's focused on the right thing for the most because part. Because when you hear that song, you think of uh, Whitney Houston, not uh, Dolly Parton. But Dolly Parton, the savage, is the one who actually made it. I love it. All right. Next, speaking of uh, opportunistic person, Chris <laughs> uh, Jenner, who I actually think is probably one of the most intelligent business people on the planet, uh, is the mother and manager, manager to like a gazillion Kardashians. <laughs> I literally don't know how many there are. She but She manages like, them all. Uh, you showed me the trailer one time for like the original Kardashian show and there was literally like a hundred of them. How many yeah. are there? Oh, okay. So there's like, I think five kids, if I'm correct. So- Oh, it's like a hundred pop boys. There's like a hundred Kardashian girls. Kim, Courtney. We, we don't have to do public math. I don't know. There's like Kylie. Five. Well- so the, Never mind. Okay. <laughs> okay. I'm not going right, to get into right. the family dynamics. <laughs> oh, no, of a no, family sorry. That Six I, children. Six children. Okay. I wrote it out. What did she do before she became Rob, the person Rob that people know now? Sorry. What did she do before she. Okay. So she has kind of a complicated life. Um, she was 17 years old when she started dating Robert. Kardashian. Okay. Who was a successful uh, attorney 11 years older at the time, right? Okay, so on. So we got 28 year old hooking up with a 17 year old. Exactly. So not exactly legal in today's world. Right. So at the time, I'm not sure, but probably not. Not legal and, and not, you know, her parents looked down upon it. So but they were she, just friends. She was 17. So she was like, thank you for your advances. I cannot pursue this. So sure, um, she did. She turned him down and pursued her career as a flight attendant because she wanted to see the world. Uh, they ultimately reunited and she married him at age 22, a very a much more appropriate age. Um, and then eight years later, she realized she was a housewife with four kids. So she had a little affair with a soccer player. So then her and Robert, after he found out- So, she, so Kris Jenner cheated on her husband. Right. Okay. So then her husband, Robert Kardashian, found out and they went through a really ugly- public divorce in which he canceled her credit cards and left her broken alone. So suddenly so she went from was a rich famous. housewife. He was famous and she wasn't. Right. Okay. Right. Okay. So then shortly thereafter, she met then Bruce Jenner on a blind date. And Bruce Jenner at the time was kind of a, like a failed star. I mean, he like he was, um, he was an Olympian. He was an Olympian. But his Olympic career kind of was kind of like stalling. Like he he was out of the Olympics, whatever. So she was like. He's kind of like a poor man's uh, um, Robert Kardashian. Like Robert was like, a star. He wasn't. Well, 
So so she ended up becoming, she was bored, right? So she ended up becoming Bruce's agent, literally putting together like these like press packets and sending them to press and being like, he's an Olympian. Like if you have a speaking gig at your conference, he'll come speak. So she ended up making him a lot of money that way. Were they hooking up then? Yeah, they, they met on a blind date, got married shortly thereafter. And then she like started helping him. Oh, wow. She married him actually a month after her divorce was finalized. Yeah. Um, and she started helping him. So they had two daughters, Kendall and Kylie. Okay. Kylie is, yep. Uh, uh, before their sh- family landed the TV Kylie show. Kylie was the uh, young one. Yeah. So she, she had two kids with Bruce Jenner. Oh, and the other ones were before. Yes. Got it. Okay. Got yeah. it. Um, so, so then, okay. So basically, to, long story short, Kris Jenner and her daughters, um, Courtney and Kim, had these like clothing stores in LA. And they really wanted to be like into fashion and they wanted to open up stores in LA, whatever. And um, let's not fool ourselves. Nothing pops off till Kim has a sex tape. Well, so they get a TV deal and then. Oh, they got the TV deal before before, the sex tape. Yes. Interesting. Yes. And then the sex tape came out. And here's what how one New York Times columnist put it. As a parent, Kris Jenner was concerned for her daughter, but as her manager, she thought, well, hot diggity. <laughs> so. Do we think um, that sex tape was real? Like they they uh, did not expect that to come out or was that a pre-planned leak no, to be famous? Not, I don't buy into the conspiracy theories, but be my guest. I, I, I didn't even know there was a conspiracy theory. So I anyway, I mean, again, luck or whatever, but now two or three of her children are billionaires. Like you cannot go from sex tape to billionaire as hard as you try. A lot of people try to do that. Is Kris Jenner a billionaire? I don't think so. No. She takes 20%, is it? 10%, I think I heard. Hold on a second. I think it was 10%. Is it 10%? Pretty sure. Yeah, it's 10%. 10%. She takes a 10% cut from each of her children's earnings. 10% is not that bad. Yeah. She says the industry average is 20%, which is why I remembered it, but. Got it. Yeah. And so she takes 10 because they're her kids. So it's like a family so, friends discount. Yeah. And, and it, if you know anything about Kris Jenner, she works. Like she does not. One of her famous quotes is, um, if I call you and some, and you say no, or if you call somebody and they say no, then you're talking to the wrong person. Like she will find a way to get you there. Um, what, I, what I learned about her is something that I myself have experienced. Um, you don't need business school to get a business school education. So basically, even though Kris Jenner was a housewife of this, you know, Robert Kardashian, she found herself at parties, at concerts, at ballets, operas, around these really successful business people. And so she learned from them. She overheard things. She asked questions. And she said, I got married to Robert Kardashian when I was 22 years old. Everybody that I was surrounded by for two decades was at the top of their game in the entertainment business. So she literally had a front row seat to someone like the brightest minds in entertainment. Whether you like it or not, you're going to pick up on things. And if you're smart, you're going to use it. All right. I agree with all that. What's next in uh, our lessons of Kris Jenner? What would you learn from her? Oh, what else? So every year she um, has an annual check-in with her kids. But I find it really interesting because she she admits that she herself is a control f- Ooh. Uh. She admits that she's a control freak and she loves controlling the narrative. But if you know one thing about the Kardashian family is that they've been through some shit, but they have never made themselves the victim ever. Like they always kind of in the most like crises of crises. I mean, Kim Kardashian got robbed at gunpoint in France. Like, Sex tape, robberies. Of, of all the things. Conversions of. They're never on the side of victim. They're always somehow, and that's like a knock against, you know, uh, Chris Jenner. It's like, oh, it's always a business opportunity. But I don't think so. I think like she talks about like, I'm a mom first, but then I'm not going to let my kid just wallow in this and like, you know, lose sight of what's important. Can, uh, can we ask the important questions? What? What is going on with the uh, Kim Kardashian, Kanye West? Why are they messing with my guy, Kanye okay, West? We're, we're not going to get into that right no, but what, now. This what is happened? not that. What I, happened? I don't know. Oh, I think Kanye was right. All right. I don't even, are they uh, disagreeing or is this amicable? I don't know. All right. Kanye so, was right. And, and that's the other thing. I, I've been watching the last season of the Kardashians, which after like 20 years, it's finally coming to an end. And they keep, they've always like, 
whenever a spouse does not want to participate in the show, they don't make them. For a while, Kanye wanted to be in it. Then he was like, no, I don't want to be in it anymore. Fine. They don't even talk about him. And when Kim was going through the divorce in this season, they kept it out. Like they showed her on the phone. They show, showed her upset, but they never kind of like aired their dirty laundry. And even in a family that public to have some privacy, I think is really interesting. Kanye West is still right. All right. I'm sure that they're screwing them somehow. They're, it, it's a, they're colluding. <sighs> they're colluding. What's up, guys? Bang, bang. I hope you're enjoying this conversation. But before we go any further, I want to quickly tell you about today's sponsor, BlockFi. BlockFi's got four different financial products for crypto investors. You can deposit crypto and earn up to 8.6% APY in an interest-bearing account. You can deposit crypto and take out a US dollar loan against your crypto collateral. You can use their cryptocurrency exchange and have no trading fees, or you can get a new Bitcoin rewards credit card. It's a normal credit card that when you swipe, you get Bitcoin back rather than cashback or airline miles. I'm an investor in the business and a very happy user. I think you will be too when you go to BlockFi.com slash POMP. Again, BlockFi.com slash POMP. Go check it out and let me know what you think. All right, let's get back into this conversation. I hope you enjoy it. All, All right. right, Daniel Eck. Daniel Eck is the uh, Spotify founder yep. and CEO. Uh, incredibly intelligent. Uh, has built an amazing business in the audio space. Now going mm -hmm. really heavy into podcasting. Went on an absolute acquisition Hair, mm -hmm. some may say. What's up with him? Okay, so he's fascinating. Why? He's probably one of my favorite CEOs. You could Did you meet, know that? You could meet a worm on the street and be like, <laughs> oh, this worm was really fascinating. And that, you literally could come back with like three things and be like, damn, that worm is pretty fascinating. Right? Yeah, go ahead. I was going to say a savage comeback, but I didn't. Go ahead. It's why I found you fascinating. Oh, because I was like the worm on <laughs> no. the street. Okay, Just perfect. like I can find anybody fascinating. All no, right. you're genuinely fascinating. I, I'm, okay. You're not bothering All me right. whatsoever whether you think I'm fascinated or <laughs> not. Well, right now you not. have very like uh, closed off body language, so I'm just saying. Um, all right, so Daniel Eck. <laughs> Listen, there's other people in the room right now. Don't make me shut this podcast off and we can- uh, Open up your body language? Like we're here to chat? No, we're okay. not here. We ha we so, are on a timer. Let's go. You're-, you're so, uh, pontificating on things that don't matter. In 2006, Daniel Eck asked himself the question, which is nearly impossible to answer. Do you have an answer for this question? What is better than free? What is better than free? Yep. If you do things and get paid for it. Damn, Daniel. Damn, yeah. Daniel. <laughs> Look at that. Okay. You're going to ask so, me easy questions? Bring the hard ones. Where's the SAT questions? So here's, here's a fun fact. <laughs> At the time in 2006, online music piracy was at like thriving in Sweden, okay. in Sweden, right? But because it was thriving, in, it was thri thriving in Sweden because of government mandated broadband and the country had one of the fastest um, internet speeds in the world, which allowed people to easily download songs and stuff on the internet in seconds. But Daniel Ike is smart and he realized, wait a second, but that's not, that's not true for the rest of the world. If you're in the US and you want to download some sketchy music, or not sketchy, you want to download music off of a sketchy website that you didn't pay for for free, it would take hours, right? Do you remember? Because mm -hmm. <laughs> mm. um, Anyway, so he, he decided that the thing that would be better than free is something that could be legal and free and fast. And he realized- Legal, free, and fast. Oh, sorry. Yes, yes. Okay. Um, so he said, I had this idea of the kind of product I wanted to see in the world. What if we can build something that makes it feel like you had all the world's music on your hard drive? And if we can create that feeling, we'll have built something much better than privacy. So um, anyway, so basically he said that if he could offer something really fast um, and people would be able to press play and it would play immediately, then people would be willing to pay for it. Okay. What do you think is the biggest lesson you learned from him? Ooh, um, okay. So I think the biggest lesson and one that I've actually thought about in my daily life um, is that he he's very busy, right? Like he has a massive company now, uh, but he typically starts working around 10 a.m. Because, and not only does he start at 10 a.m., he also limits his calendar to three to four meetings a day. Um, and this is based on what he read of Paul Graham's idea of a maker schedule versus a manager's schedule. 
So when you're operating on a manager schedule, your calendar has all the meetings in the world. You're on other people's time. But if you're a maker, you devote long chunks of time to work on creative problem. And uh, they generally prefer to use time in units uh, of half a day that allow them to work on longer term media initiatives than have them sliced up in little chunks. So that's how he schedules his day. And every meeting he walks into, he knows the exact role he is playing. And he knows, you. what do you need from me in this meeting? He likes to know that in advance. When he goes in, he can make decisions quickly. I like that a lot. I also bet that his meetings are much shorter than most people. Yeah. And he literally, like half the day, he'll reserve for strategic thinking because that is the role of him as CEO, right? Yeah. Do you Are you long Spotify podcasting? <sighs> Wanna, Ooh, he ain't I, so fascinating now. I want to be. They made a bunch of acquisitions. They but do you think it's going to work? On this podcast, we <sighs> put our opinions on the line. Well, but Apple just launched that sleek new. So do you think Spotify? Podcasts, no. Music, yes. Okay. I actually have a nuanced answer. Tell me. Spotify, Spotify will continue to grab more and more of the podcast market share, but they but will never won't. be able to unseat Apple. Agree. Agree? Yep. All right. Next, one of my favorite people in the world of business, Mr. Tyler Perry, also known as Medea. <laughs> so when he was little, a teacher asked him what he wanted to be when he grew up, and he answered with a one-word answer, even though he didn't know any at the time. He said, billionaire. <laughs> what a boss. <laughs> And, what a boss. And so she told him that he would never make it because he was poor and he was black. And he said, even as a child, there was something in me that said, that's not true. Don't believe that. And what is he now? A billionaire. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. The uh, part that I like about Tyler Perry, though, is that uh, he owns, what's it called? Tyler Perry Enterprise, I he think. He owns it all. He owns 100%, no investors, all him, billion dollars alone just through that. He has amassed one of the most valuable individually owned libraries in Hollywood. Really? And that happened because a bunch of people, when he was creating these plays and these movies, people would turn him down. And he was like, okay, fine. Well, I'll own 100%. Then like he had no choice but to own 100%. And now his motto has become own your stuff, own your business, own your way. He's really big on ownership. And he learned that from Oprah. Yeah. Oprah is an absolute animal too. I love it. Yeah. So, all right. Tyler Perry owns 100% of yep. everything he does, mm -hmm. including, doesn't he own a bunch of real estate in Atlanta? Yes. At some point they like helped him buy in 2019, he opened the largest privately owned motion picture studio in the U.S. It is a 330-acre former Confederate Army base that now houses 12 sound stages, each of which is named after an iconic African-American figure. And he shot... That's awesome. The first movie he shot there was Black Panther. It's cool, I mean, right? he, he just gets it, right? And you can just tell he's doing things his own way. Yeah. And it feels like that's why he's so successful. Yeah, um, so... so I like him because, you know, when people are like, who was your mentor growing up? And like, who did you aspire to be? He was like, I didn't know my mentor. He was like, I would come home from school and I would turn on the television and I would watch the Oprah show. And to him, she was more influential in his life, even though he didn't know her because she talked, she owned the Oprah show. She owned like the, uh, her own. Partially TV. at the time. Oh, really? Yeah. Okay, well, there's a great if anyone wants to learn more about Oprah, they should go to the Acquired oh, FM yeah, podcast. Right. They have an entire episode on Oprah Winfrey, probably one of the best podcast episodes I've ever listened to. They yeah. do a really, really good job with it. And, and the reason I like that is because that's the whole premise of the profile. You don't actually have to know the people you learn from. You can still learn from their mistakes, their failures and their successes just by studying them. Do you feel like Tyler Perry would be more successful or less successful if he was starting today, given the internet and oh, digital media? A hundred percent more successful. Why? Oh my God. Like he would, he would hold these plays and the way he would get the word out is through like flyers and like imagine having Facebook or Twitter or like you could mobilize Who's people. still on Facebook? Okay. You could mobilize, kidding, I was thinking kidding, of Facebook kidding. groups. Kidding. You could mobilize people on a level that like you never, it, it was all local then, you know? All right. Next person, last person, 
probably the kindest human on planet Earth, Keanu Reeves. Keanu Reeves. And and by the way, the only thing I know about him before you went and did this was if you've ever seen the movie Hardball. You ever seen it? No? Hardball, he basically is a coach. He oh. goes and he coaches like an inner city uh, baseball team. And at one point he literally is in the dugout and he starts singing Big Papa. And he starts Wait, s- waving his hands in the air. You didn't know him from The Matrix? Nah. <laughs> I don't watch that stuff. I knew him from The Matrix. So you I watched The Matrix? You sat down and watched um, The whole Matrix? So yes, because it was constantly on TBS when we moved to the United States and I had to watch it. Yeah. Constantly. Well, well you were red-pilled when I met you, so... Exactly. Make sure you catch my eye. Okay. Yeah. Um, I did catch your eye. That's why we're married. <laughs> 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 Go ahead. Tell me about Help. Keanu Reeves. Help. Okay. So I didn't know. I mean, how oh. lucky is she? <laughs> so I didn't know anything about Keanu except for the fact that people had always said he is known for doing these random acts of kindness. So uh, there's a video on the internet, a viral video of him uh, seeing a woman with a large bag and he got up from his seat on the subway, which he rides, even though he's worth like $300 million. He gets up, offers her the seat. She sits down. He just like acts like nothing ever happened. Another time uh, he was caught uh, for hours hanging out with a homeless man um, and just like chilling, telling stories. They were eating together. Um, and then uh, and then another time, uh, he jumped out of a car to autograph a sign he saw on a fan's lawn. It, it's just like he 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 does these. Are little these things. PR moments? Or are they? No, real? no, 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 no. They're not. Like the the right. yeah, it, they're not. So anyway, so he's just always doing random little things. Um, but what a lot of people don't know about Keanu is that he actually he's really really big into giving back. Um, and he does much bigger acts of kindness and. I believe it's because of all the tragedy that he's been through. What tragedy? So when he was not, so first of all, he had dyslexia. He always struggled in school. When he was nine, his dad left the family. He was raised by his mom um, and, and he grew up with a sister. Then his sister got leukemia. Then when he grew up, uh, things were just starting to go his way. Like the matrix was doing really well. And then, um, and then he had a longtime girlfriend and their baby was born, stillborn at eight months. That was a really big tragedy for him. And then 18 months later, his girlfriend died in, tragically in a car accident. So it's like time and time and time again. And then you find out, literally you have to find out that there are no reports on this. He does it anonymously. Like he tries to keep everything really quiet, but he's like a massive donor to um, children's uh, cancer hospitals and research and all that kind of stuff. Um, and, uh, and then he's also known for, for example, um, the matrix series, he gave up a percentage of the profits that he was getting to give them to the costume design team and the special effects team. Cause he's like, they're the ones who made the movie. I didn't make the movie. They deserve to be paid, uh, profits off the, uh, off the series too. He did that. He shaved his salary by a few million dollars for the devil's advocate just because he wanted to get Al Pacino. So they're like, we can only well, why get- Why is Al Pacino him? being so damn greedy? <laughs> Come on, awesome. Al, let's split it a little bit here. I give up a little bit, you give up a little bit. And he did the same thing on the replacements to be able to work with Gene Hackman. Gene Hackman, why are you being greedy? <laughs> Come on, I give up a little bit, you give up a little bit. Jesus. So it's just like those things that kind of tell you what type of person he was. And I'll never forget, I read a profile on him and the reporter was like, so, why are you like not public about, you know, um, or well, she she said something like, are you not public about uh, the fact that you make donations to children's cancer hospitals uh, because, uh, you know, you're, I forget what the question was like, because you, you, you want people to find out in like a PR room. He goes, no, I do it because it's private and that's why I don't attach my name to it. Like it has nothing to do with PR or publicity or anything like that. It was just such a, I don't know. I just really like him. What's the most surprising fact about him that people won't know? Well, I just said a bunch of ones that people don't know. But we know those now because we've been listening. Um, okay. Um, okay. Oh. Okay. That was a really weird noise. <laughs> uh, um, 
All right. So, okay. So, his father leaving, his father also got arrested for like heroin and cocaine, spent a bunch of time in prison. Uh, that really affected him. And every time, in every interview, people ask him about it. So, uh, every time he responds, so for example, this in this profile, they asked about how his father's absence affected him. And he said, gosh, in so many ways, I'm not filling that in. I'm not. And he never talks about his childhood. He never talks about his parents. Um, and he makes no apologies for like preserving his privacy. And the reporter kept pushing. And he said, I just really don't want to tell you. And that was it. I feel like that's fair. Yeah, but you you know, like I feel like if you're a celebrity and you're out there promoting a movie, they tell you like talk about everything. It's good. People like the vulnerable. They like the, and he's like, this is not for you to know, right? I'm here promoting the Matrix, but I'm not going to talk about my father's absence. He should have just pulled out two hands and be like, red pill, blue pill, <laughs> and see what the, the the journalist said. All right, what's your favorite part about doing these uh, profile dossiers? My favorite thing is trying to understand people without ever meeting them. And I do that by, um, well, first of all, a lot of observation. You'd be surprised at how much you can learn about someone by watching them. So there's a ton of videos of these people giving interviews, whatever. Um, watching somebody like Keanu, for example, he's always kind of like, he's kind of like, um, again, body language is very closed off. He He doesn't appear to be like the life of the party. When you look at somebody like Same. Martha Stewart, she is she's posting out thirst there. traps. She's on Instagram. posting thirst traps on Instagram. It's about how they present themselves, and then also it's about what they say. When you hear something over and over and over again, but then they say it, but then their actions don't match their words, you're like, eh. So you're kind of like putting on a show. For him, it's consistently, I will not speak about my private life, um, and I just really like people. Okay. <laughs> Readthepropile.com? Yes. Now that we've been in wait, Miami, I've wait. Worked, what? What's your favorite thing about the profile? Oh, I just like learning. I, I you do all the work and then I get to take away all the lessons. It's like the best thing ever. Liter sure. Literally. And for those that are confused, I'm a paying member of he the is profile. A paying member. Thank you. I appreciate your I was the second support paying member ever. Yeah. Somebody beat me. Somebody too. beat me, which is nonsense. <laughs> but I was the second paying member ever. And I've continued to pay high loyalty, very high retention user right here. Uh, but I know I like it that you go and you do all the work. You find all the podcasts. You distill it all down. I just have to read one email. Bam. I feel like I got all the value. You did all the work. That is how life works. It's amazing. <laughs> uh, Readtheprofile.com. Yes. Leave everyone with one pro and one con of Miami before we go. You have to pick one positive and one negative so far of living in Miami. One pro is that I've been pleasantly surprised at the caliber of conversation and people that are in Miami. I've already made so many friends and like real friends, not just, you know, fake friends. Okay. Um, and then and then con. Yeah. Um, I I sweated today. It was hot. <laughs> you sweated? That's I a con? Sweated. Okay. Well, it was that, hot out there. Well, that's it for today. <laughs> Readtheprofile.com. Go follow Paulina at, what, what's your Twitter account now? At Paulina underscore Marinova. All right. We'll do it again sometime. <laughs>